Gentlemen, James Marshall here from the Natural Lifestyles and reporting for 21 Convention from my bed. Now, I've got a very important video for you today. This I recently released on my own channel. It got a whole lot of buzz and feedback from guys that it really resonated with and I wanted to share it with you guys here today. This is all about the six phases that you will inevitably need to go through over the long term when you're trying to become excellent with women. Most guys think that seduction is about learning um, some techniques or a method, getting good at it, and then forgetting about it. But really, this is a long game. This is about personal evolution and growth. And if you don't understand the different phases that you will need to go through and master, then it's very easy to fall off the track and basically give up. I consider this to be probably one of the most important videos that I've ever put out. I suggest you watch it, hope you enjoy. Gentlemen, James Marshall here. Today I want to cover a topic which I get asked about a lot, which stems around this question, which is how long does it take to get good at this? All right? So guys ask me this a lot, especially when they come on a workshop after a couple of days, when they've been out slogging it out in field and getting the inevitable rejections and all the uh, nasty stuff that happens when you first start this and they start thinking, ah, oh, how long does it, is this going to last? Like how long is it going to go on all this going up to girls and them saying, go away before I can finally just be surrounded by chicks all the time and not have to worry about this. And usually I don't like to give guys any definitive answer about this because most men who are getting involved in seduction are often very analytical. They tend to think about things in terms of metrics and that's not really the way I teach. I don't want you to try to think oh, I need to do a thousand approaches in order to get X level of, of ability. However, what I do want to talk about today is something that's um, become really apparent to me as I have been writing my book, which is in a nutshell that there are distinct phases that you will go through if you follow this journey to its, conclus to its conclusion. There is no conclusion, it cycles around and starts again. But if you take it through to your potential, you will come through what I've just broken down into six distinct phases. And it is really important that when you get into this, that you start to look at this as a long game, right? Because I think many men come into the seduction sphere and what they think is, okay, I'm going to learn a method, a method, choose a method, and I'm gonna get really good at it, and then I will be done. Then I will always have pussy and girlfriends and love in my life. It doesn't really work like that. It's not like riding a bicycle. You don't just learn it once and then you're done for life. The process takes time. And in answer to that question, how long does it take? I am going to give an answer now. It, in my experience, my personal experience, and from teaching many people and watching guys get good at this, it takes at least two years and often up to five years to get very good at this. Now, before you go, oh shit, five years, screw this, I'm gonna go and watch Game of Thrones. Uh, you need to be aware that I don't mean it's gonna take five years before you get laid. I don't mean it's gonna take two years before you get results. You can get results now, right? If you just turn off your computer and walk out the door, don't even listen to the end of this video and go and talk to a girl, you'll get a result, right? You'll get some learning. You might even get that girl's number. You might even end up fucking that girl. So you, of course you can get results almost instantly as soon as you start taking correct action. But what I'm talking about is in order for this to become an instinct, something that is truly internalized and something that works whether or not you're in a good state, whether or not you're depressed or super supremely happy, uh, I know that I can go tomorrow morning very grumpy and in a bad mood or whatever, and I can make this work. I'm not, I'm not dependent on my state. I don't have to be warmed up. Uh, for the last few weeks, I've been l literally locked in this room, writing my book, filming all this stuff. Uh, I haven't approached a girl in ages. And tomorrow, sorry, next week, I have to go and teach a workshop. I'll get up on the Monday, I'll go out and I'll teach, get my group of guys in Budapest and I'll start approaching girls and demonstrating. And within a couple of sets, I'll be fine. I'll be back on because of all of the years of, of work that I did previous to that. So what, what I want, the purpose of this video is to start to get your head around the idea that this is going to be an arc of development that is going to last years. 
And it's a beautiful arc. The, those years are not something to dread. Those will be the best years of your life, actually. When I look back uh, over my life, that period when I really started getting into this and through to when I really had it locked in, even though that was the, probably the most difficult part of my life, it's so precious to me. I learned more in that period than I ever did and ever will again. The, the curve was exponential. And as I've been writing this book, which is about my life during that period over the last, well, particularly over the last few months, I've been thinking a lot about this. And it was during this writing process that I started to really divide these phases and look at them as distinct, discrete entities and see that, yeah, they, they do exist and they happen pretty much to anyone who goes and follows this rabbit hole as far as it can go. And so I wanted to give you guys a brief taste of that tonight, just to, so you can start thinking about where is this going long term. In my, as part of my book launch, which is coming out this week, I have put together a very long version of this. Um, it's, it's essentially a course that allows you to plot out the next two to five years of your life, psychologically, and also for in terms of what behaviors and what methods you're going to be following. Because if you have a roadmap, in the same way that you start university and you do X amount of years study because you know that at the end of that you'll be qualified to move on to something else. Um, you should start thinking about your seduction practice like that. Don't think of it like, oh, I'm trying to learn this pickup skill today and hopefully I can get it over with as soon as possible so I can just stop feeling these weird feelings when I talk to girls. Uh, I have always looked at seduction as a catalyst and a, uh, a mechanism for ex expansive personal growth for a supreme personal growth. It's always been around about trying to find myself, not run away from myself. It's always been, a, been about developing myself, not just trying to develop a skill, right? So let's just look at these very briefly at what these six phases are that you will inevitably go through, whether, whether I call them six phases or not, they're going to happen to you if you follow this and look, and the, the nature of them is that within each phase, are certain inherent pitfalls, certain things that are very difficult or, or aspects that people tend to get bogged down in and plateau or often give up. And that's what you need to be really wary of because if you're not aware of what the characteristics, the tendencies of the phase are, then it's very easy to fall off into the pitfalls that are associated with it. On the other hand, there are certain lessons and goals and breakthroughs that you will be aiming to, to go through during that phase. And these are the things that you need to focus on. Okay. So if you look at phase one, which I call the beginner's mind, phase one is where a lot of men are currently at. This is where you are first becoming conscious that it's possible for just a normal guy to start going and talking to women. They find very attractive in everyday situations, whether that's day game, night game on the street, in the club, whatever. Prior to you being aware of that as an idea and most for most, people now that's a fairly uh, mainstream idea. Back when I was starting this in the early 2000s, that was not a common idea. It was not generally accepted that a normal dude could just go and do this. Now, because of the internet, because of the proliferation of this information, most people can at least intellectually accept that it's possible. For the guys that are out there that, that keep holding on to these it's only for short, tall guys. It's only if you're good looking. It's only if you're not Asian. It's all um, they hire actresses every time they do infield. All of this stuff that we keep seeing on our infield videos and other infield videos. I just feel really sorry for you guys. Um, I'm not faking my infield videos. I get laid. Liam gets laid. My students get laid. I've got nothing to really prove anymore. You are the poor fucker that's the one that has to sit there holding on to this limiting belief and not getting laid. So I can't do much for the people that are holding on to these limitations. But for most guys, okay, they accept that it's a possibility. They're entertaining a space inside their psychology. And this is where the beginner's mind phase really develops. It's that process of thinking about it, planning it, investigating material. Um, but the pitfall of that is of course that you stay there. You stay in the analysis or the worst, the situation that I explained where you deny that it's possible. This is also the phase where people start going out and, and hopefully starting to talk to girls. And this is the beginner's hell. Okay. So when you first go out approaching girls, often you get a lot of rejections. You don't get what you hope you're going to get instantly. You don't necessarily get the numbers or the kisses or the dates or the sex. Uh, and then sometimes you just do, sometimes you just get laid because you go out and you try the guys that pull the trigger, try to pull the trigger. 
are the ones that get laid. I always say that. The people who get good at this are the ones who try to open and try to close. The rest in the middle, you'll get better at that as we go along. Okay, so this is the beginner's mind phase and you need to accept that it, in, it inherently has a lot of struggle in it and a lot of struggle and self-doubt as well because at this point you don't necessarily have enough reference experiences uh, of success. You don't yet really have faith in yourself, in the system or the, the action of, of seduction. Uh, and so it, it is a very delicate phase and it is one where you need to change your benchmark of goals. Don't, don't think you're gonna get models the day you go out and talk to girls. Maybe you will, okay, maybe you'll get a model. But if it, you do, that will be an outlier. That will be um, just a statistical anomaly more likely that you'll get a, a variety of results, many of which will just be feedback, learning, experience. That's really what you're trying to take from this beginner's phase. Okay, so if you keep going, and unfortunately many men don't, they, they do this, they go and do a dozen approaches and they're like, oh, that was, I didn't like that. That felt weird. I feel silly, I was embarrassed. Uh, this is, I'll just, I'll, I'll go and do some more research and I'll get back to this in a year. Don't do that, please. Just stay with it because yes, it gets better. The second phase is the dating game. That's what I call it. This is where you are now comfortable enough with everyday approaching. You can approach girls in the day. You can approach them at clubs. You're not an expert. It's not perfect. You don't get the girls all the time, but you are getting numbers. You're getting dates. Uh, sometimes you get laid. You're still probably going through periods long periods of enforced celibacy. You're probably not um, getting sex as often as you'd like. You're still dealing with a lot of the frustrations. And now because you're, in, you're deeper into the interactions with girls, so you're on dates, you'll have more of those experiences where you're having, you're sitting across a girl at a date and it's just not working. The conversation's not necessarily flowing. <clears throat> or you get through that and then you almost get her home and she slips through your fingers uh, and then she doesn't return your calls. Uh, right, so this, this phase is more about consolidation. This is about getting more experience with not just the meeting a girl and getting a phone number, it's getting more experience with being with women. Right, so spending good amounts of time with attractive women. And for many men, that's, that's new. Yeah? Especially if, if you've come from technical backgrounds or female isolated backgrounds due to your culture or your, your choice of career or whatever. Uh, and you don't spend a lot of time around beautiful women, this is, should be really the major aim for this time, is to get used to being around hot girls, learn how to be relaxed with them, learn how to have conversations, learn about what makes them tick, what they're actually thinking, what they actually respond to. This is a great time for much more uh, deeper experimentation, and that should really be what you're looking for. What I would say the main um, pitfall of this second phase is settling, right? Because at this phase, you will start to have sex. You'll be dating girls and sometimes they'll take their clothes off and, uh, and, you'll, and you won't be looking through their window. You'll be in the room with them. And then the temptation can be to just go, all right, well, this girl's cute uh, and she's nice. I haven't met a girl that's like this maybe even before and she wants to have a relationship, so I think I should do that because I'm not sure if I'm really gonna get any better at this or this is, or it gets any better than this at all. And that's a very bad mistake to make. At this point in your development, phase two, when you're really still just learning about women and about dating and uh, how they tick, you shouldn't be getting into a long-term relationship. Definitely start having casual relationships, start having fuck buddies, don't just have one night stands. I don't advocate having lots and lots of one night stands particularly. I don't judge them. Sure, I've had some great one night stands, but you don't get to know somebody that well, usually in one night. And you, if, if that is the, the style of seduction you're getting into, which is just like 4 a.m. trashy pickups where you take home drunk girls and bang them and don't see them again, if you continue like that, I've met some people who do that for decades, that's a very shallow existence and you'll never learn much about women it's, and you'll never have any really great connections. So yeah, sure, have the odd one night stand when it comes along, but I would be aiming to develop sexual relationships with women, but not exclusive, get stuck in one for years at this point. Reason being, you don't have choice yet. 
If you get into a serious relationship when you don't have choice, then you will lose power very quickly. The woman will very often wrap you around her little finger and crush you because more or less you asked her to, because you stepped into it without the resources and the boundaries to know what you really want and what you're really willing to put up with. So that is the danger, main danger of phase two. Phase three is multiple lovers. Now this is where stuff gets really fun and really complicated, really interesting. So this phase is where we're going, uh, we're coming out of the going on lots of dates to now we are seeing girls regularly, not just one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe more. I, for a time, have tried to do this with around five girls. That's too many. Unless you're only doing this. <laughs> Remember that I don't have a normal job. And in the, in the book that I wrote, it, it reaches this peak where I reached the sex pentangle, which is five girlfriends all at once because I just wanted to see if that was possible. Uh, it is. I don't think it's that healthy. So this is having a couple of lovers or two, three girls that you see regularly, maybe one you see once a week, one that you only see once a month because she comes into town every now and then. If this is where you start to work out the, the multiple relationship dynamics. Now, some guys will be at this point going, well, that's not really what I'm after. I don't really want to have five girlfriends or three girlfriends or even two girlfriends. I got into this because I wanted to get a great girlfriend. Fine. That is a perfectly healthy and reasonable goal. And I'm not here to try and convince everyone they need to be polyamorous and have 10 girlfriends. However, it goes back to what I said before about choice. Most men follow this cycle, inactive single. Single, not because they wanna be, but because they have to be. Celibate, not out of choice, more or less. They're not getting any sex. Maybe they occasionally get lucky just at a party or one drunken night. Uh, and then long, dry stretches of no sex. And they think that's normal. Like guys talk about that. Oh, I've been through a dry patch. I'm like, what does that mean? Oh, you know, like I haven't been laid in a few months. A few months? If, they, if that's where, where, where you have come to a point where you think that's normal, then I, I've got news for you. That's not okay. That is not okay. If you're in that position, you need to desperately get out of that position. To be a happy, healthy, functional adult male, you need to be having sex a lot, every week at least, right? I mean, I pr prefer to have sex every day. Um, and I worked very hard and very diligently to get to the point where that is my reality. I have sex every day, I want to have sex now. Um, there, was, there was times in my life where I didn't, and that is painful. And for guys where that's lasting months, how can you really be concentrate on anything else? How can you actually enjoy your life if you're not getting the base level of, of sexual and intimacy satisfaction? So most people, most men, sorry, go from inactive single to eventually they come across a girl, usually how? Through their social circle and she's okay or she's decent or she's just, she'll do or she, or she, she will have sex with you. And the girl decides usually, okay, yeah, I want a boyfriend and then you start a relationship. That lasts for however long, a year, two years, five years, 10 years, and children maybe, whatever it is, you break up inevitably and the man is out cold again on the street, often heartbroken or, or, or overweight or out of practice socially, back out to inactive single. And then he continues that, a lot, that miserable path until eventually he bumps into another girl and does that again. Then what does he do? He does that one, two, three times over about 10 years, maybe. And then when he's in his 30s or his late 20s, one, that girl decides she wants children. And so he more or less has to marry her. They have kids and that's the end of his dating life. And that's the woman he's gonna be with. It doesn't usually end there actually. That relationship then lasts five, 10, 15 years. They have a horrible divorce. The guy loses half, his, half or more of his shit. There's children and law and courts involved and it's a horrific mess, right? I deal with this all the time. I'm teaching men who come out of those positions and men who are headed in that direction if they don't do something very serious about it. So make no mistake, if you don't take action in your dating life and you don't happen to have a really good social circle, uh, sometimes guys can get away with this. That's why cool guys and girls will sometimes say, hey, you know, shouldn't people just get together? like? 
Isn't it a bit contrived to be learning this dating stuff? You should just, you know, just be yourself, chill out, you'll meet somebody. Yeah, it's very fucky and easy for you to say, cool hipster bar dude. Of course you meet people. You're a cool hipster bar dude and there's chicks around you all the time. If you're a, if you're a guy who was brought up nerdy and is working in engineering, there's no cool people or there's no chicks around. There's no just chilling out at the party waiting for the girls to arrive. Okay, so when people say that, I get pissed off because I'm like, that is you coming from a very entitled position uh, because you happen to be socially very well positioned or very attractive uh, or have one of these distinct advantages. For the average man out there, he's going to have to take very, very clear action in order to change this not very um, enjoyable cycle that he's inevitably going to end up in which is why I tell you, you must get to phase three, right? If you wanna have a cool girlfriend, you have to choose her. How do you choose her? By having different cool girls in your life, different sexy, interesting, uh, loving people who are gonna be good to you so that you know what that's like, right? People get in abusive relationships because they're used to it. They don't know any better and that goes for men and women. Uh, you know, the women, women who are beaten by their, by their boyfriends or husband people try to get them out and they often go back because they feel that's what they're worth because that's what they're used to, right? In the same way I see guys who are browbeaten by, um, you know, overbearing uh, women who just crush their souls because they feel that's all they can get because they're used to that, right? So if that resonates with you at all or you feel like that might be the path you're going down, you need to be able to date more than one girl in order to choose the right one. Phase four. Is, a, is probably not what you would expect. It's the breakdown. So this can happen at any time, right? So the, and these phases, most, they do work generally in, a, in a, a, a chronology. However, the breakdown can happen at any time, but it often happens when you're juggling a, a lot of girls or when you're coming to a crisis point in a relationship. And so by breakdown, I mean literally that, I mean, a mental and emotional and possibly physical breakdown. I mean crying, I mean depression, I mean locking yourself in your room, I mean banging your head against a wall, I mean self-harm, I mean self-medication, I mean all the dark, uh, hidden sh and often shameful things that happen to everybody, but in this case I'm talking about men, as they go through a process of self-discovery. Because self-help doesn't talk about this. Self-help is about positivity. It is about motivation. It is about morning routines and wheatgrass juice and doing the right kind of push-ups and all that stuff, which is great. Great, wheatgrass juice and paleo and all that stuff and smiling and affirmations, all good stuff. <clears throat> However, the reality of human life is it doesn't work like that. You don't just get on the super positivity program and then after that your life's awesome and there's never a, a moment of, of self-doubt. In my book, when you guys read it, you will see that I go through some very, very dark phases. I go through suicidal thoughts. I go through period, and this is when I'm getting laid. This is not me alone. This is me dealing with the existential crisis of suddenly having all these people's hearts that I'm somehow responsible for, of, uh, of really questioning my self-worth as a human being, of feeling like I'm a fraud, of, of hiding behind arrogance and bluster and, and false identities, right? Because when you get into seduction as a life pursuit, as something that is a catalyst for deep change, what you're really saying to the universe is, give me the extreme, give me the extreme life. And if you ask for it and you move towards it, you'll get it, you'll get the extremes, you'll get the sex and the threesomes and the glamour and the, uh, you know, the power and the glory and you will get the shadow. For all of that, right? You can live in a fairly mediocre average bandwidth of life and kind of avoid the extremes. And to me, that's a slow death, right? That was always my motivation for getting good at this and progressing was that I, I wanted anything else except that. I, I so desperately didn't want a life where I was sitting with a girlfriend where I was like, and watching TV shows and you know, meeting our couple friends who are also looking at each other and going, oh shit, is this it? Is that it? I was, I was willing to do anything. I was willing to be desperately alone and, 
and live in despair and be broke and whatever else I had to, to be away from that, right? So I was talking to my good friend, James McLean, dating coach today, we were filming some extra uh, bonuses for um, the launch. And, and I asked him like, what was it that propelled you to have these women that are of such exceptional beauty, which is something he's well known for. And it turned out that it wasn't like this super positive motivation. It was an extreme heartbreak and having his life fall apart that made him get up and move, right? So the breakdown will, will inevitably, breakdowns happen in your life and men are very bad at dealing with them usually. We're not taught to express our emotions. We don't usually talk to each other about these feelings. That's why when men try to kill themselves, they kill themselves. When women often try to kill themselves because they want to get some attention, right? When a man decides he's gonna to top himself, he drives his car into a wall. He hangs himself. Women take pills, just a few, and then sort of, you know, people find them and then give them some more support. Uh, it's hard for us as men to express ourselves, to cry, to ask for help, to fall apart because our worth as human beings is judged by whether we're successful, right? No, men are so scared of being losers that they can't accept that sometimes they need to fall apart. And so this is one of the phases that I look in in this program, which most self-help kind of uh, programs would, would avoid totally, is that it's okay to fall apart. It's okay to uh, be on your path and just lose it. It's okay to fucking, you know, need to go and talk to a psychologist or um, a therapist or even in some extreme cases to go to a hospital or to get on medication. I'm not, I don't advocate everyone getting on antidepressants. I think they can be heavily overused, but there's circumstances where these, interventions need to be involved. Better that you actually learn to navigate the breakdown rather than wait till it gets to a, a deadly point in your life. All right, so what's the, how, do you, how do you make best use of a breakdown? Well, you don't wanna stay there forever. You don't wanna roll around in depression forever. However, the, the thing to take out of it is that it is often a signal for you to redirect your life. It's the midlife crisis, right? That's, that's a common thing. I try to have a midlife crisis every year. I think it's good. Have a, have a, have a mid-year crisis. Let yourself fall into a heap. Uh, have a cry. Smack your head against the wall. Say to yourself, I'm nothing. I'm a loser. And then go, all right, okay. Enough, enough melodrama. Where am I trying to change? What, what, what is it about my life that is, that is not working that I need to adjust? And then you can get back on the cycle. This is the perfect time to retreat. I and all of my, the guys in my crew, we do at least one retreat a year. So that may be going into the Amazon jungle and taking ayahuasca. That may be doing a 10 day Vipassana retreat. For me, that's often going and doing martial arts retreats. Um, all of us here are writers and we take time away. I'm in a retreat right now. I've barely left this room in weeks because I've been writing and not just writing, but I've been introspective. I've been looking back over my life. I've been taking stock of where I've come from and where I'm going. These are good things to do. Don't save those till your retirement. Don't save those until someone has to put you in a mental institute because you just exploded. Right? It is important phase to learn to master and not avoid because it's going to come one way or another. Heavy shit, huh? It's, it's important. Phase five is the one. We're told about the one pretty much from the moment we can conceptualize things. We are fed a certain storyline in terms of romantic love and women are fed this very, very heavily, uh, but we are as well, that there is a soulmate out there for you. There is almost a predestined partner. It's like the other piece of a two person puzzle is out there waiting for you. You, it was built for you and you only. And that at some point, you guys will inevitably meet thanks to the stars crossing and fate aligning. And then when you do, your life will be perfect. You will live happily ever after and that's it. This is the fairy tale that we are sold in terms of how relationships come together. Most people after they've had a couple of relationships start to realize that that doesn't seem to work exactly like that. However, we do often hold on to this idea that when we're ready, the right person will turn up. 
And that's a really dangerous, dangerous um, myth to hold in your mind. Uh, it's possibly one of the most damaging myths you could ever, ever believe uh, is that the one is coming. Because what it says is, you just have to wait. You don't really have to do much. Okay, maybe you need to go to, to some speed dating things or sort of meet some people, but they, they're coming. And it also says you don't need to change. Yeah, you are perfect, more or less how you are, because somewhere out there, there's this other person that will complete you. Even if you feel deep down that you're not worthy or that you're not, you're not living your full potential, there's this idea that another person will come and fix that for you. And that's bullshit. It's a complete fabrication. It's completely untrue. <clears throat> and and such, a, such an absurd statistical kind of idea too that the that out of all these people on the planet that each one of us has a perfect match out there that we're all going to line up with how how is that going to happen i don't see how that that makes any mathematical sense either however it is something that people carry around and especially for nice guys guys who didn't have much luck with women it's it's a way to to kind of give yourself some solace in the same way that religion gives very very poor <laughs> fucking pe people who are living in fucked up situations some kind of hope because at least in the afterlife you'll get rewarded for being shat on in this life i don't want to take that away from those people because maybe they need it as someone famously said religion is the opium of the masses i don't remember who that was but <clears throat> i would say the one is also the opium of the masses the opium of the beta the opium of the nice guy it's this concept that okay be nice do your job earn money, buy a house, get a car, the girl will come. And no, she won't. A girl will come. Someone will turn up at probably at some point and then you will have to convince yourself that that is the one. All right. So when I'm talking about this phase of stepping into the one, I'm, step I'm talking about not that. I am talking about when you have earned the one, when you have become the one. Right? Because at, if you've gone through this beginner's hell, Phase one, learning seduction, learning, learning meeting people, learning basic social skills, learning how to have some choice. You've gone through the dating uh, rigmarole of understanding women, of communicating with them, of learning how to touch them, learning what they like uh, in terms of uh, being interacted with. You've started becoming their lovers. You've learned to become an, a great lover. You know how to make girls have orgasms. Uh, you start to understand their fantasies and that a lot of them are darker and weirder and way more complicated than uh, anything you've ever imagined. And you've become a man of value because you are hold yourself to be valuable, because you have become interesting, because you have a, a wealth of life experience. Hopefully you've traveled, you've, you've got skills and hobbies and interests that make you a well-rounded character. Now you're starting to become ready to meet and pick up and seduce an exceptional woman. And in my book, you see this, right? I go through this process, this hero's journey, these phases. I have my breakdown, it's a couple of them actually. <laughs> and, uh, and I keep going and at some point I meet a woman that I am finally ready for. She was the one for me at that time. And if I hadn't have done all of the other stuff and I'd met her, fate wouldn't have gone, here she is. She just would have looked at me and gone, some dude, so what? But because I'd done all that training and, and all, had all of those experiences, I was at a point where, yes, now I was matching her. Now I was her equal. Now I was ready. And this will happen to you probably in your, in your journey that you'll, be, you'll reach a point, you'll be dating a bunch of girls and then one of them, will appear that just makes you question this whole lifestyle. I talk to guys about, they ask me this fairly regularly. I get guys who are reaching the point of, uh, you know, the phase three dating multiple lo lovers. And they say, well, there's this one girl, she's really cute. And she, well, she's actually the hottest girl I've ever been with. She's lovely. Uh, maybe I should just be with her. Wouldn't that be a smart decision? And I say to them, if you're asking me like that, then it's not the right decision. If, if there's question, if it's really a compromise and you're looking to balance things out and going, well, on one hand there's this, but on the other hand there's this, you're still settling. And no judgment, okay, sometimes people settle and then they make it work and then they grow to love each other and they have functional relationships and they don't, you don't have to have the most extreme life possible. For me, I want the best that is possible in my life, 
So I would say if you, that's what you want, then if there's any question in your mind, should I be with just this girl? Then you shouldn't. If, if it's so clear to you, if, it's, if everything in your body and your cells screams, this is the girl, this is the one for now, then do it and throw yourself into it 100%. And the way, you, the, the, the way that you build that, the paradigm that you live within is up to you. It doesn't have to be monogamous, man, woman, only be together. That's what society tells you. You can have a primary lover and you can have other lovers. You can have an, uh, a relationship like I do now where I have one lover who I'm deeply in love with. She's my partner. And we also bring other girls to join us because we're both interested in females. Um, there's all sorts of different dynamics that people can do and that's up to you to build with your partner or partners, right? So, but what, what I am talking about is a primary relationship, one where you are invested emotionally, where you're in love with this person. The dangers of this are many, the pitfalls are many, mainly to do with being with the wrong person, staying together with somebody too long, losing your own personal identity, becoming codependent. Monogamous or very deeply committed relationships have a lot of in, inherent flaws and dangers within them, and it takes constant vigilance to A, keep the relationship fun and vital, and B, not become this one single-celled, like, depressing organism. All right, so that's your phase five. Phase six, and everyone's like, what, what, what phase six? Phase five, happily ever after, right? Really, guys? Really? No. Phase six is the breakup. Yet another piece of um, self-help area that most people don't talk about. If people are talking of uh, giving love advice or relationship advice, they very rarely would tell you how to have good breakups, how to learn the skill of breaking up. And I'm here to tell you that is one of the most important skills you need to know. I've been through a number of serious relationships in my life. I've had a number of breakups and they've been bad <laughs> and some of them have crippled me for years. Literally, they've wiped me out in terms of feeling alive. And a really bad breakup does that to you. Some people never recover from bad breakups. They carry cynicism and, and baggage for the rest of their life because of one deep heartbreak that they had. And that's because they didn't learn to process the breakup and they didn't accept that it is actually a natural part of the cycle. Okay. Sometimes, very occasionally, a boy and a girl will meet, they'll stay together for the rest of their lives and they'll be very, very happy about that. Of course, in my parents' generation, particularly my grandparents' generation, people did stay together for their entire lives, often. That wasn't because back then they were better at being in love for 50 years, really. That was because back then marriage was different. It was not necessarily based on a feeling of romantic entanglement, it was based on practicalities. You have to get married in order to survive. You have to have children. It's part of the way the society is built. There's not really any other options. You can't be gay. You can't live in uh, unwed situations. Uh, you can't, it was just not accepted, right? So people did, they stayed together for a long, long time mostly. But were they happy? Were your grandparents happy all their lives? Mine certainly weren't. Um, people did it because that was the done thing and because they were keeping families together. <clears throat> Whether you think that was a golden age or not, I think today's uh, much more interesting because now we have the choice to tell people to fuck off, to say, you know, don't like you anymore and I don't have to stay here for another 20 years. In fact, I think I'm just gonna go. And that's a good thing because many relationships, even really good ones, reach a point where they're no longer good. Uh, I've had some awesome relationships in my life, but at some point, they became bad and they were toxic and they were no longer serving me. And knowing when it is time to leave a relationship is a vital skill. Most people, myself included, stay in a relationship about 30% at least longer than they should. And I have clients often, because I talk to them always about their lives, their previous relationships, and I hear things like, I was with my ex-wife for 10 years. It was after the first year that I realized I didn't love her. And I'm like, oh, dude, oh. And then we had kids because I thought that would make things better. You know, these kinds of decisions and you just, it makes you want to cry because people have put 
years into a partnership that was a bad idea. Not because that woman was an awful, evil human being. Maybe sometimes they are, but mostly not. Because Not because you're an arsehole cunt either. Just because you two are not compatible. Or you were compatible for some time and then you became not compatible. So, phase six, if you want to be a true master of this cycle, is learning to separate from a partner at the right time. Be able to process the emotions, the grief, the mourning, the anger, whatever, the jealousy, whatever it is that comes out of that. And, it, and allow yourself to feel that. And then to transmute it and let it go. So that you can then return back to phase one. But you're not returning back to phase one as the novice that you first started. It's more like a spiral, right? So you're going one, two, three, four, five, six, and now we're at one, but we're at a higher level. Now you have all of the learning, the understanding, the experience, the, you know, the expansiveness to, to do this journey again, which is, okay, I'm a single guy again. What am I gonna do? Um, am I gonna lie in my bed and cry? Well, yeah, do that for a week if you want to. Uh, but am I gonna stay there? No. I'm going to get back out. I'm going to meet some girls. I'm not going to try to replace my last girlfriend because that was a heavy, intense relationship. I'm just going to go out and do that approaching thing again because I can, because I have the skills. Because if I did it the other way, the inactive single, monogamous inactive single, I'm coming out like a baby again, just going, oh shit, I am all alone and I'm older and slower. And a lot of my friends seem to have disappeared because I was in, I was in a tiny little box for four years. And, oh shit, I guess I'm going to go on rsvp.com or start swiping on Tinder. It doesn't work, guys. It just makes your fingers sore. It's a waste of fucking time. Yeah. Right? So, there you have it in a very small nutshell. The next, <laughs> next two to 50 years of your life. But the point of this video is I wanted you to want you to start being conscious of this, to start looking at your love life as an arc of growth, not just a skill set that you're learning, not just a uh, scramble away from a pain point to the nearest woman that's going to look after you, because you'll pay the price for that. If you don't do this consciously, then it will just happen to you and you and it won't be fun. You won't get the best. It's like, it's like winning the lottery as opposed to learning how to become an entrepreneur that becomes wealthy, right? People who try to win the lottery are delusional if they think that's the way they're gonna get rich. It's the same way that guys who think they're gonna get their 10, their one, by hanging around and waiting and waiting for the one, it's the same kind of delusional bullshit. People who get wealthy, people learn how to understand money, understand business, understand that process, take some risks, lose it all, start again, lose it all, keep going until they get somewhere. Guys who get exceptional women, who have exceptional relationships, are the ones that go through these six phases and then come around at some point at the back to, not to square one, but to the beginning again from a different place and then run it again. And in that way, each time you run that cycle, maybe you do it two, three, ten, I don't know, there can be many uh, rotations that will be different for every person, but it will mean that each time you come out stronger, better and more prepared for a, a, an absolutely excellent life, which is coming to you because you've earned it. So if this has been interesting to you, uh, if it hasn't been, then I may as well quit because I think this is pretty interesting and important stuff. I will be presenting in my product that I'm releasing this week, uh, a much more expanded version of this, a program for you to actually plan and prepare and build action steps to work through these six phases in a way that's functional, that actually serves you. So that you, you can not make all of the mistakes necessarily that I have to make, not have all of the heartbreak and the, and the long breakdowns. You can just make your breakdowns effective um, and work for you. So that's James Marshall from The Natural Lifestyles signing out. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Now before I go, I've got a very special announcement, which is that after 10 years of writing, I have finally finished and am now, right now, releasing my first ever book, which is called A Natural History, The Seduction Journals of James Marshall, which is exactly that. The evolution, the story of me going from broke, 
loser, hippie musician, through to international man of mystery and sexual abundance. I dish the dirt on myself, this is no holds barred. I tell everything, my ups and downs, from Shaolin Temple through to becoming a porn star, a rock star, massage therapist, all my failures, and right through to juggling five amazing girlfriends until I finally find the girl of my dreams. It's a crazy ride, and if you guys are interested, then click the link below for full details. This is James Marshall from The Natural Lifestyles, and reporting for 21 Convention, signing out. Oh, yeah.